with the Lord in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for us. But we will experience the fullness of it through the help of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we are settled and rested in the authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. A month of divine direction in Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We are daily loaded with God's benefits. Amen. Hallelujah. Our parts are going brighter and brighter, even unto a perfect day. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just echoing what has been hallelujah shared on the chat. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Fruitfulness on all sides and divine recognition in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. We'll see progress only and desire being fulfilled. Desires being fulfilled in righteousness in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we'll continue with that. Hallelujah. After the devotion. And I yield my mic uh, to Minister Jude. God bless you. Amen. I'm happy to give more to those of us who are already in it. Wow. And for those of us who are on the thirtieth, yes, your new month is on the way anyway. Yes, already here. <laughs> oh yeah. Amen. Amen. So um, it's my privilege once again to minister the word to God's people from this corner of the world. But of course, um, let us take a moment to pray before we commence with the devotion. Father, in the name of Jesus, the Most High God, you who reigns from eternity past to eternity to come, you who is not affected by geographical distance, you who reigns across time zones. Yes. Lord, even as we break bread this morning, as we take time to study your word but we ask that you teach us yes. holy spirit we invite you to take charge take control yes. Yes. let your word be like the seed that fell on good soil and let it bring forth fruit in jesus name i pray yeah. amen, amen. So as usual, um, we'll be continuing from the book of John, chapter 4. Um, and as we know, um, for those of us who were here uh, yesterday, Apostle Takweta started um, the teaching. And we are all, and we, of course, and we know that we were still on the issue of the, the encounter of Jesus with the woman at Samaria, the Samaritan woman. And one thing I want us to take note of before we go into the Bible reading proper is that Jesus, even though he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, there were certain people outside of Israel who caught his attention. Yes. And this Samaritan woman is one of them. Another one is a Syrophoenician woman Another one, I think, the Roman centurion. In other words, certain kinds of people. And one thing that all the people had in common was the unusual faith, mm. or what you call uncommon faith that they that that they had for the words of Jesus. They took Jesus at his word, oh my God. even much more seriously than the supposed elects of the house of Israel. Even much more seriously than the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were supposed to be teachers of the law, who should have known better. But let us read uh, from John chapter 4, um, from verse 25 to 42. Anyone who is led to read can please read John chapter 4, verse 25 to 42. NLT, sir? Yes, NLT, please. Amen. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. 
when he comes, he would explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who has told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know, not, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest as people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvesters alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans believed. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Jesus heals an official son. At the end of the two days, Jesus I, went I think, on to... Sorry, sure. I, th I think it ends at 42. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Those, the, the, that verse 42 really rings true. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, mm. not just because of what you told us, yes. but because we have heard him ourselves, and we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Jesus spent two days in this Samaritan village. Two days he spent there, and that was enough for the vast majority of the Samaritans to believe him. But let us go back to verse 25 and maybe give, it, give this a little bit of context before we begin to um, critically examine this encounter with this woman. You know, Jesus had met her, this conversation started with his request for water and he goes on and on, okay, I'll give you living water. He does not worship God, I worship him in spirit and in truth. And the conversation goes on and on. And then it gets to the point where she is now talking, making reference to the Father. Oh, I know that when the Messiah comes, he will teach us all things. And Jesus looks at her and says, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Remember, this is when he calls himself the I am. The Jews understood what he meant. Remember when he, he, he encountered the Pharisees and he told them, before Abraham was, I, I am. And they were looking at him as someone who was blasphemous because they felt, why should you say that? Aren't you the son of the carpenter, Joseph? Didn't you see you wearing diapers and going up and down as a little boy? So why should you open your mouth and say, 
before Abraham was, I am. So oftentimes when Jesus was in the house of, you know, within uh, Israel, he wasn't always quick to reveal his true identity. But already because Jesus perceived that this Samaritan woman was already a fruit that was ripe for harvest, he could see that she was ready, which was often the reason, which I'm, I'm sure was the reason he decided to pass through Samaria because he wanted to encounter this woman, this potential evangelist that was waiting to be made manifest. If you knew that someone had five husbands, just a question. Would you, how would you perceive her? Would you want to speak with her? Or if maybe you knew somebody who had, you know, somebody who has been branded as um, a stranger, estranged, or somebody who possibly had a colorful past that you were aware of, or somebody maybe, or maybe you even knew this person yourself. Would you be seen? speaking with this person in public. You don't have to answer the question, you understand? Because, you know, th there are two sides to this. But now here was Jesus. Jesus always had the knack for seeing past our mistakes, seeing past the labor that people or the society gives us. And it is this kind of woman that he looks up to and says, I am the Messiah. There was something this woman was looking for that she couldn't find. And so when, and, 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 and obviously she was looking for this fulfillment, you know, there was this vacuum she was trying to fill. She was looking for, that. there was a, a driving need that she had. And maybe she was hoping to find this in marriage. There are certain things that we do sometimes and it is filled by an inner craving, some need that we are trying to satisfy. Some people try to find it maybe through financial success. Some try to find it in marriage. Some try to find it through having children. Some try to find it through maybe doing one thing or the other. Some people even go through other ways, maybe through drugs, trying to get high, whatever, whatever it is, whether it be good or bad, a virtue or a vice. Oftentimes we are driven by something that we want. We are often driven by that. And so, we are people driven by our needs, and this is not wrong, but we can be wrong in the way we try to satisfy them. The Samaritan woman was looking for a need in marriage that she was not getting. But when she encounters the one who gave her the living water, she abandoned her water pot and ran to the city. Remember that she had come to the well to fetch water. But when she encountered Jesus, she was so excited that she couldn't be bothered about carrying the pot. She had to run to the Samaritan village to tell them, see a man who told me everything I've, I've ever did. The water pot didn't matter anymore. She was, you know, she had found another purpose. She was driven by something else now. Now she was driven by the need to share her testimony. I perceive that there are some of us on this platform who have some very interesting testimonies about our salvation experience that maybe we have not really shared to people yet. Or maybe we have shared it, but we haven't shared it enough. You might think it's no big deal. But you'll be amazed how much your testimony might turn someone else's life around. This Samaritan woman shared her testimony and Jesus had to stay in Samaria for two days sharing the word. She was no longer living for her immediate needs. She had a higher need now. She had a higher purpose beyond just fetching water from the well or beyond just trying to find some sort of satisfaction in marriage. She had encountered Jesus, the living water. She took him at his word when he said, I am the Messiah. The 
Samaritans didn't try to throw stones at Jesus. They didn't see him as someone who was a blasphemer for calling himself the I am. Here was Jesus being celebrated and appreciated in Samaria even much more than in Israel. And that's because here he needed Jesus perceived that the harvest was ripe. If we go back to the Bible verse, you know, he gives a whole lot of agricultural imagery there. To, he says, really, he said, um, let me go back to that verse. Um, verse 26, okay. Um, okay, so after the disciples came and met him, and you know, they were trying to give him food, and Jesus was so excited because he knew that this woman was going to win many more souls. She had run off, left her water pot to go spread the news about her encounter with Jesus. Then the disciples came and they wanted to feed him. And Jesus said, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. And they were busy wondering, did someone bring him food? Did someone give him jollof rice and chicken while we were on the way or something? What happened? You know? And he began to explain to them, he said, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruits they harvest is people brought to eternal life. So Jesus Christ perceived that he, in Samaria, there was a ripe harvest. And he knew that opportune moment he knew that this was the Kairos moment. This was the time to go forth and harvest. This is one lesson we need to learn here from Jesus. The fact that we should, you know, that, that we should get so in tune with the Spirit that we should know when it is time to plant and when it is time for harvesting. But it's something remarkable that he says here that I want us to take note of. He says, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. So there will be points, even in, in, in the way we, when we try to embark on evangelism, there are people that we are going to come across who, and by the time we share the word with them, they may appear not to have received it. But maybe what we have done at that time was to plant. Some other person might do the watering and some other person might do the harvest, the, 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 the harvesting. And this particularly rings true when we are talking, especially when it comes to evangelizing to friends and relatives. Oftentimes, due to our emotional attachment to our friends or our relatives, we tend to not know when it is time to plant, or when it's time to water or to harvest. Most times they want to harvest immediately. They want, and, and, I, and I know it's a wonderful feeling. I mean, people don't like that. The fact that you preach to somebody and immediately the person gives their life to Christ. But more often than not, anybody who has done evangelism will tell you that it doesn't always happen that way. Because not everybody is ready to, not every soil is prepared. And so if you remember that parable of the sower, it talks about the seed that fell on good soil, some seed fell on rocky ground, some others fell in the place where thorns came and choked it up. So sometimes when we are sowing the seed of the world, especially in the course of evangelism, the soil might not have been prepared. Maybe there, there could be some need for us to plow the ground, soften it, fertilize it, make it conducive for the seed to germinate and grow. And preparing the soil might mean that you may have to pray. It could be maybe that you need to pray for that person. Sometimes for an extended period of time before they are able to receive the word. Sometimes you may need to wait for an opportune moment. Maybe it's, you know, some people don't receive the word until they go through some difficult situation or circumstance. At that time, they are much more vulnerable and willing to receive the seed of the word. For some others, it might even take years before they eventually receive that seed. And for some, they may never receive it. But regardless, you get paid for your wages. 
whether they are the one who plants, the one who waters, or the one who eventually does the harvesting. The Samaritans were already at that point where they were ready to be harvested. And even though they were not like the Jews, you know, the, 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 the Jews saw them as people who had a twisted kind of religion. One thing they definitely had in common with the Jews was that they were also expecting the Messiah. At least on that, 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 that was one one place where, where the, both the Jews and the Samaritans had a common ground. They were both expecting, both nations were expecting the Messiah. And so here was Jesus, whose ministry was restricted to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, veering off to Samaria because of a precious soul who was going to lead him to more souls. And so another thing we can learn from this Samaritan woman is that we should not be, don't be a dead end convert. Mm. This is one thing I'm sure that people who do network marketing will understand. The market with network marketing even borrows this same model. Now, for those of you who are familiar, they will always tell you, okay, when you recruit someone, a good network marketer is somebody who is able to recruit somebody who is able to recruit somebody and then it grows. That way the team grows. And then the more your network increases, the more profit you make. So here in the kingdom of God, when you become born again, it is expected that you yourself should become fruitful. Some of us might be planters, some of us might water, some of us might harvest, some of us might even do all three at different points in time. But the point is that we should keep doing something. So you might be here, maybe you feel that every time I preach to people, they never get to that point where they accept Jesus. You may have done the planting. Somebody else will do the watering. And somebody else might be the one to do the harvesting. And maybe in some cases, you might be the one who, do, who goes through the, 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 the entire process of planting, watering, and harvesting. But whichever way it happens, the point is that we must keep ensuring that we are doing all we can to win souls. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit to help us. If Jesus was thinking like most of us would, this one would, would probably not be saved. If he was so bent on, if he was so fixated on ministering to strictly to the Israelites, this one would have been left out and souls in Samaria wouldn't have encountered Jesus. Besides the word of knowledge that Jesus gave away, he said, oh, you've had five husbands and the man you're staying with is not your husband. Besides that word of knowledge, the Bible doesn't tell us that there's any other sign of miracle that Jesus performed in Samaria. All they just said was, we, we have heard. Now, we not only believe because of what she said, we believe because we have heard your word. They didn't see Jesus heal the sick. They didn't see him raise the dead. They didn't see those wonderful things he did in Israel. Yet they were much more receptive than the supposed elect. I want us to look at this here because Jesus Christ knew that this was the moment for the Samaritans to get saved. And that was already brought food to him. He was way too excited. This was beyond him just feeding his flesh now. He saw that there was a, there was a bountiful harvest in the land of Samaria. And that was all he was occupied with. But note what he says. He says the harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. I'm reading from verse 36 of our text. So whether you're the one who plants or the one who harvests, you just do your own bit. Do your own bit. Take Jesus at his word. The I am, the Messiah. Take him at his word. Not just like the Samaritans did.
when they came to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days. He said, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed a savior of the world. Hallelujah. These were people who understood faith. They got it at just one go. They didn't need to be told again and again and again. They were indeed ripe for harvest. Jesus had been to places where he was asked to leave. You know, if you, if you remember, um, somewhere in the Gospels, I think after, yes, after Jesus delivered the madman of Gadara, that was a miracle he performed. And yet the people in that region did not accept him because they felt maybe he had ruined their business because the evil spirits went into the head of swine and the swine just jumped over. So they saw him as a spoiler. This dude just comes around and ruins business for us. What does he think he's doing? They couldn't care less about the madman. He could be mad for all they care as long as their business was thriving. So for them, Jesus had to go. He was dismissed. But here were the Samaritans who were more than happy to have him. Where well, once they begged him to stay, so he had to stay for two days. And, he, and to think he didn't perform the miracle or the oil sign there, all he just gave was the word. Brethren, there is always a place for the word. Above every other thing, sharing the word of God is the most essential. Signs and wonders are good and they have their place. But the word of God must always take the dominant space. It must, it must take preeminence over every other thing. If you look at the ministries that have thrived over the years, there are ministries that have thrived by studying the word through Bible study. They, they, they're not just concerned about signs and wonders and miracles and just trying to draw the crowd. You just you know, do the research on your own. Look out for those ministries that have lasted over time, that have stood the test of time. One common denominator you will find is that they have laid emphasis on the word. Their emphasis, yes, and even though in these ministries you find out that there are signs and wonders, there are miracles, there are breakthroughs, and all those dramatic things that we tend to like, all those things that draw lots of media attention, more often than not, it is their ability to keep studying the word that keeps them. Because we live in a world where we need to know the word for ourselves, where we need to get more familiar with the word of God. And this is what we can learn from the Samaritans here. The word of God was enough for them, even without the miracles, even without the signs. When Jesus gave that word of knowledge to the woman, he wasn't coming from a judgmental point of view. He was simply trying to make her realize that what she was, that she was looking for the right thing in the wrong place. If you are lonely, marriage will not make you any less lonely. Sometimes it might even make you much more lonely if you don't even, if care is not taken. If there's some kind of fulfillment you want, that fulfillment can be found in Jesus. He is the I am, the Messiah. He is everything you need. Someone was gave it, put it in a, in a mathematical way. He said E plus M equals to A. Emmanuel plus me equals achievement. What do you want to achieve? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? What need drives you? Like the case of this Samaritan woman. Take Jesus at his word when he says, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am enough for you.
call from unknown. Jesus, what? Take that word and run with it. That's all you need. It was enough for the Samaritans. It can be enough for you as well. First Corinthians 3 verse 6 to 8. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planted and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. This was Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 to 8. Jesus understood this. So the fact that you came across someone, you preached to them, and they immediately gave their life to Jesus. It could be that someone else had done the planting and the watering before you came along to do the harvesting. But whether we are planting or watering, let us keep working as laborers in evangelism. Let our testimony be like that of the Samaritans, that you heard the word of Jesus and that was enough for you to be living for that situation you are going through. enough. Call from unknown. The fruits, the thirties, the sixties and hundreds, and even in unlimited amounts in the name of Jesus. Father, as your word has gone forth this morning, we pray, O oh Lord God, that it shall yield for fruit. We are taking you at your word. We are believing that you are enough for us, that you are the I am. Before that problem came, you were before that situation came up, you've always been there. You are the I am that precedes everything that has, that, that has ever been, even before creation. Lord, like this Samaritan woman, may we not be dead end followers who do not bring any fruit, who do not lead people to you. Give us the grace to run with your word, to testify, and to win as many souls as we can into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I hear my mind. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. giving us some time to reflect on the word. Because I see a need for us to repent for the Lord where we have not just taken him at his word. Or we have sometimes unconsciously just disqualified things because we have not seen not this regarding miracles but just your word just your word and it's not just because your word is powerful I have not seen your word as sufficient for us we repent Lord anyone identifies with that has, that what has been shared today and you, you find yourself in that category and you see the need to repent. Speak to the Lord. By the way, we have not seen your word as sufficient for us. May God have mercy. 
no seu nome. And your word is you. Your word is who you are. It's your word that produces miracles, but we need to have your word first. It's your word that grounds us. It's your word that keeps us stable in you. But we have not seen it as sufficient. Have mercy, Lord. mercy where we have not prioritized your word do we prioritize prayer over your word have mercy Lord we prioritize our needs over your word have mercy it always used to amaze me when we were at service and, and you know a man of God would present the word almost like after the service is finished you see a very long line and that one is finished now it's my need it's the one I need to pray for me it's like Lord what happened to the word that was presented was it because we did not see that sufficient or we were just not even listening to understand that many of our answers are in the word Many of the solutions that you're seeking for in the word. The healing comes from the word. The wisdom comes from the word of God. We repent and we say, Lord, have mercy. We've seen the word as a burden for us to even embrace, to listen to, to read, to digest. It's like it's too much. So I'm sleeping tablets, sleeping peel. Oh, mercy, Lord. go back to say that this is the emphasis of this account in the beginning was the word the word is who we need I must enjoy fellowship It's his word that unfolds and opens the eyes of understanding to deeper encounters with God. And this St. John, because of his encounter with the word, opened his eyes to spiritual realities or things to come. We are praying for such encounters, Lord. To understand the weight, the importance of your word, your word. This word needs to abide in us, because that's what would yield fruits. We need to be, we need to be herald of your words, of your word. That's what would yield save souls. We need your help, Holy Ghost. We need your help. I want us to take a moment to make a commitment to the Lord. And as we heard this, let's make a commitment. Lord, from this day I would... I don't know what your commitment would be. 
lot of fruitless there. I would pay attention to ensure that I truly trust in your word. I'm truly paying attention in your word. I will check with your Holy Spirit. Because you can see with my heart and you are the revealer of things that we don't even know. If there's any area in my life, Lord, that I'm not truly trusting in your word, bring it to my attention, Holy Spirit. If you want to join me to make that commitment, make that commitment to the Lord. Lord, we are sorry for the times we have not paid attention, we have not just received your word. We are looking for something else that, not even when it comes, we don't even know what it looks like. Things that would appeal to our emotions, appeal to our excitement, but not disregarding the importance of your word. We repent, Lord. Lord, as it has been presented to us, we make a commitment. Oh, We make a commitment, Lord. Make a commitment. Oh, we make a commitment to Holy Spirit through your hell. Embrace your word. Remember when Minister Daphne said that oh, we can help us, Lord, to marinate, to allow your word to marinate our hearts. Paul says that his word will be engraved in our hearts. The writer of the Hebrew talks about this word being engraved in our hearts as the new, the new covenant, my God. Lord, we yield to that process. And that process really is through hearing and hearing again and hearing again and hearing again and hearing, again and hearing it again. Because faith comes by hearing. The word of God comes by hearing. We hear the word of God. And we hear it again and again. Oh, we've heard that before. No, we hear it again. Look, I listen to this again. We've heard this account before. Look at what, what has been presented to us today. Hearing it again. Thank you for your son that you've used to help to straighten us up this morning. Pray that you replenish him, strengthen him in the name of Jesus. And we may also have deeper encounters of your word. So we all yield to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And there's another part of the commitment that we need to make that we will share this word. Jesus said the harvest is ripe. You don't need to look at timing. He said the harvest is ripe. Wake up, look up. The harvest is ready. There are people that are ready to embrace God's word. Lord, may we come across those people. May we be bold and not ashamed of the gospel. In the name of Jesus. I don't have access to people. You have access to social media. Share the word on your social media platform. People are watching. 
the way that you know that people are watching your profile is when you put something silly and they respond but when you put something on what god's word they don't respond it's okay put god's word there they see it as well whether it appeals to them or not it doesn't matter you just be a herald of the word of the king give the message as it is someone somewhere would see it and they might not respond to you personally but they will respond to God because of what you have shared on your platform so i pray that we are also intentional about that that is what that person says i don't have access to people with them you know we don't have any excuses as people of god there's so many uh, opportunities that we have to share god's word all the woman did, did was to come and see the man who told me everything about myself she didn't preach a complicated message jesus has changed my life jesus spoke into my life come and hear him pray the holy spirit that you put a word in our hearts and our mouth that are those that we come in touch with or come in contact with or even on our platforms will put a word that would convict hearts to come to know you in Jesus name amen and amen and amen so thank you again minister Jude thank you to everyone who's um, stayed here and heard God's word as we continue to grow together I also want to thank the ministers of God who are here with us in Jesus name you joining us for the first time you're welcome um this is what we do daily in this room we pray and we get into God's word which is our tool for transformation no one should come to God and remain the same Jesus came so that we would be saved and also be bearers of the same gospel to others in Jesus name if you hear you haven't given your life to Jesus may i use this opportunity um to ask is there anyone here who has not given their life to Christ and you would like to take this moment to say lord jesus i've heard your word today and just your word through this word i i make a commitment to yield my heart my life and everything that you give into me give it back to you the finish work that you did in the cross of Calvary for me. I could not have paid the price that you paid for me. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you that your blood washes away sins and washes away my sins and has already made provision for that. Thank you that you didn't just die but you rose again from the dead. And you are now living inside of me through your Holy Spirit. I accept you into my life. And make you my lord, the owner of me now. From this day forward. I choose your way, I choose your word, I choose your life. Everything that is of you, I make it my choice from this day forward. And I ask the Holy Spirit that you'd help me to stay on this journey and never look back. Not even look to the right or to the left. In Jesus' name. And if you're here, you are. Say you're struggling in your walk with the Lord, and maybe you there's one foot in and one foot out. I want you to know that the grace of God is available to you, and it's not a life that you've been called to live by yourself. I always remind us that this is a life that we are called to have total dependency on the Lord. And this for all of us. If you're trying to work out your salvation or work it out, work it out by yourself, then it would be a struggle. Um, but if you allow the Holy Spirit to help you and be true to Him, say, Holy Spirit, I need your help in this area. I, 
I'm falling short in this area of my life and I need your help. I'm falling short in whatever area and I need your help. If you're true to yourself with him, he would help you because he is our helper. Speak to him, speak to him. If you're in any of that category, maybe if it's even your prayer life, ask him to help you. In your work life, ask him to help you. You may say, well, when I read, I don't understand. Ask him to give you understanding. There's nothing that we need that the Holy Spirit is not sufficient to help. He is our all-sufficient one because he has been given to us by God the Father. In fact, he's God with us. So wherever you're struggling in your walk, God is made himself available to help us. Receive his help today. In Jesus' name. Amen. If there's anyone sick in the room, I declare your healing. In the name of Jesus. The word heals. He sent forth his word and he healed them. And I release God's word to heal your spirit, soul, and body. I release God's word to heal you right now. In the name of Jesus. To heal your mind. I release God's word to heal your mind. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.